this is not a hard review of the FNAF movie. It is a soft review. What I mean by that is, I'm going to be looking at the general story beats, writing, directing, VFX, and soundtrack of the FNAF movie. I will, on occasion, mention a specific scene that I have something to say about and give my thoughts on it. But I'm not giving this movie a numbered score. If you want the TLDR, is it a good movie, I say, yeah. I had a lot of fun watching it, so much so that I watch it twice in the same day. But it does have its flaws and I will be going over those as well. Enough dilly dallying though, let's get into it. Oh, and this review contains spoilers. The first thing I want to talk about are the characters. I really, really, really like all of them. All four members of the main cast I think were well written and well performed. I am especially impressed with Josh Hutcherson. He did an absolutely stellar job as Mike throughout the whole movie. I did not expect PETA to go this hard. Kudos to him. But special shout out to Matthew Lilliard during the spring lock scene also, very good job. Let's talk about the writing though. Mike is probably my favorite character, with Abby as a very close second. I am impressed at how well they characterized Abby considering she only really got to shine in the final act. Honestly, I found Mike and Abby's relationship to be really believable and touching. No boring exposition or clunky dialogue like we see in the novels, we just got to see a convincing bond between an adult who doesn't know what he's doing but is genuinely trying his best, and a child who, while knowing more than she lets on, is still a child at heart. I love that kind of relationship in media. You can really feel the complex emotions they feel towards one another within the first half hour of the movie. Mike especially was characterized very well from the very start. From his very first scenes, the audience immediately gets a general idea of who he is and what he's gone through without any dialogue. You can tell he overworks himself trying to provide for Abby. You can tell he has trauma that deals with the kidnapping. Personally, I think his weakest character moment is also probably the weakest writing moment of the whole movie. When Yellow Child is tempting Mike with a false reality where he gets his old family back in exchange for Abby, Mike accepts the deal at first, only to take it back. My problem here is that the movie paints it like, if Mike didn't accept Yellow Child's offer then the animatronics wouldn't have tried to take Abby, which I feel like they would have tried to do regardless if Mike agreed. I think if we just remove the part where Mike verbally agrees, and we just let the audience see Mike considering it via his expressions only, both Mike and the movie as a whole would have been better. This one is a nitpick, but I also find it kind of weird how Mike just accepted that there are ghosts instead of the animatronics and was totally chill with that. I wish we saw him looking into paranormal activity early in the movie because he was desperate to see Garen again, as that would have made it less jarring when Mike acts like ghost possessing animatronics is a totally normal event. He's still a great character though, I got very attached to him and his struggles throughout the movie. Honestly, intentionally dipping back into his most traumatic and painful memory every night, with the external excuse being, I want to solve the mystery of who took my brother, but the true internal reason being, I want to change what happened, is a very compelling character beat. Mike's really good, keep him as the main protagonist for the whole trilogy. Abby is my second favorite character. I really like her. Like I said earlier, her sibling caretaker bond with Mike was very believable and relatable. All of their shared dialogue felt very on point and in character, except for that one scene after the fort building where Mike leaves Abby with the animatronics to go talk to Vanessa, despite previously being very wary of the animatronics and not wanting Abby near them, that was a little weird. I think they managed to convey Abby's love for Mike really well despite how much they bicker. It felt really in line with the hate on the outside love on the inside relationship of a big brother and little sister. I think with how much they highlight that Abby draws pictures of Mike a lot really allowed the crossing out scene where Abby gets mad at Mike to have a lot of impact. I mentioned this in my last video about the FNAF movie, go watch that later by the way. But Abby's line near the end of the movie when she's staring at Afton and goes, They can see you now. They know what you did. Is probably my favorite line from the whole film. I'm really pained to say it. But Vanessa is probably the weakest character of the main cast. That's not to say she's badly written or anything like that, I actually think she's very likable and they do a really good job in making it clear that Vanessa is trying very hard to get Mike to leave Freddy's. I think her line when she says, you can do whatever you want with your own life, but if you bring Abby here again, I'll shoot you, was especially good. For one thing, her being so protective of this child she barely knows makes her likable, but more so it's a real nice touch that she only says that when she's in the parking lot of Freddy's where William cannot see or hear her through his cameras. Great attention to detail. The reason I think she's the weakest member of the main cast is because I feel like they didn't really manage to properly show how Mike and Abby changed her. Because she tells the audience that, in the presence of her father, she is helpless. It's implied it would only take a few words from William to shut her down completely. But in the final act, she pulls a gun on him and even shoots him in the arm. I get what they were going for. They were trying to demonstrate that Mike and Abby's relationship, which in a way is a parent-child relationship, has managed to get Vanessa to the point where she's capable of disobeying William. But we don't see this character develop to this point on screen. I think one short flashback of her as a child where William is shown to be a cruel father to showcase how different Mike and Abby's relationship is would have solved this problem completely. 
Not Vanessa's fault, it's just an outcome of the movie's runtime. Her scene with William is not all bad though. I like how she's able to quickly pull a gun out on the yellow rabbit, so William takes off his helmet so she has to look at her father's face, making it easier to manipulate her and making her less likely to pull the trigger. William is, of course, the final member of the main cast and the main antagonist. I think, despite how little screen time he has, they do a great job at characterizing him. His iconic line of, symmetry, my friend, was really, really good. In three words, we can tell he fancies himself as a kind of artist, in a way. We immediately get what kind of character he is. Even his line when he calls the animatronics his children gives the audience a peek into his character and how he seems not only himself, but how he sees his victims in relation to himself. I'm glad that William getting spinlocked was in this movie and that wasn't in one of the sequels, not only because it's a satisfying climax to the final act, but also because it follows the rule of Chekhov's gun since Vanessa mentioned the Ellis locks earlier. Overall, I'd say the writing is really good for the main cast. The side characters are a bit iffy, I don't know why this lawyer is showcased so much or why they bother implying Max is a crush on Mike since they don't matter, but it's not a big deal. Obviously Mike and Abby's aunt is the most important side character outside of Yellow Child, and I think she's fine. Not a deep character by any means, but she didn't need to be anyway. Yellow Child is by far more interesting. I'm very excited to see him play a bigger role in the sequels. Although I think some of his dialogue is a little weird. I understand they wanted him to be menacing and threatening and creepy, but some of his lines really do not sound like anything even remotely close to what a child would say. I can forgive it though because he is menacing and threatening and creepy. And that's it for the writing. Now onto the directing. I don't have much to say, to be honest. I'm much more into character writing and dialogue than directing and shot composition. I will say I think Bloomhouse likes to do epic, intense framing a lot of the time. It doesn't always land. There's this one shot during the scene where the ghosts are clawing at Mike in Dreamland where it looks like Scoozy straight up roundhouse slaps Mike and it's very funny. There's also this thing when William is getting springlocked where Freddy does like a weird roar of victory. It kills me every time I see it. Visual effects, and more specifically the designs for the animatronics seems to be the thing most people didn't like about the movie. Personally, I think the animatronics look pretty good. Foxy and Ella look especially great. Versions of them that are costumes meant to be worn by actors look a little less good, but still passable. The red eyes are a little bit goofy though. I've ultimately made my peace with them and I understand they have a role in the story. I just wish that the red eyes looked brighter, like an LED kind of thing. A vivid, bright glow rather than just a dull red sphere, you know what I mean? In terms of VFX, I think it was fine. It's not an Avengers movie, most of the effects are just lights flickering, but I think it did its job well. It fits the atmosphere of the setting and the general tone and type of horror in old FNAF, I think. Although the scene where the foxy ghost cries black tears looked sort of off, I get what they were trying to do by evoking the black tears of the ghost in the games, but it didn't really hit me the way it was supposed to, I think. The cupcake probably had the worst VFX. Because of how slow the animation is during the scene where Mike electrocutes the cupcake, it looks like it literally levitates towards him rather than launching at him. There's also this shot where Chica is bending down to let the cupcake into the vents, but it's shot so that they don't have to animate the cupcake leaving the plate. It makes me chuckle. On to the musical score. I'm not a musician, and I don't even listen to a ton of music in general, but I thought the soundtrack was great. Like, really great. I like it a lot. Special shout out to the OST of the Springlock scene. The part where the spotlights are hitting Abby's drawing and the animatronics are looking at it especially hit hard. I can't praise it enough. Before I give my closing thoughts, I want to point out some stuff that didn't really fit anywhere else. The first thing we see with this movie is a random security guard that doesn't have any lines other than whimpers that gets murdered immediately. You see this kind of thing in a lot of horror, thriller, and action movies where an unnamed overweight guy is the first on-screen death usually to set up the killer or horror elements so the audience can see what it looks like to have the antagonist goals succeed. It does that well enough, but I just think it's a tire trope. This nod to Sparky is cute. Susie is not William's first victim, and Yellow Child is not his last. Maybe he didn't kill the kids one by one, but instead lured them one by one, and then when they were all in the storage room, then he killed them and got to Susie first and to Yellow Child last? Chica's happy rainbow is in this Froyo place. That's cool. Mike says, I could drop dead tomorrow. Is that foreshadowing? Are we going to see Purple Mike? Will he be scooped? Yellow Child comes to get Abby and also talks to Mike for the first time on night 3, Golden Freddy's night. Isn't that neat? At the end of the movie, right before Yellow Child closes the door on William, the welcome lights have all gone out except for W-L-O-M-E, which sounds like William, kinda? Finally, Chica has pause. 
it upsets me on a very deep emotional level. Okay, so closing thoughts. I think making a movie for this franchise with its passionate fan base and extremely complex lore was a very daunting task, and I think Blumhouse did a really fantastic job. It has its flaws, and even though in a vacuum the writing is just pretty good, I think compared to almost all the other big films that have come out in the last few years, this movie's writing is outstanding. The best part about the movie is its characters. They feel real and believable, and their stories are compelling and interesting. Honestly, the worst part of the movie is the amount of anxiety I have that the follow-up sequels to this movie will dip really heavy into sci-fi themes or throw a time-traveling ball pit at us. I hope you enjoyed this soft review of the FNAF movie. Please consider subscribing if you enjoyed the video. I know the visuals weren't very engaging. Peacock has blogs for screenshots and screen recordings, so I've had to make do. I hope you've had fun listening to me ramble regardless. Bye. Thank you.